So obviously money is a very important topic, especially when you're getting to know someone, you're dating, you're engaged, or you're just about to get married, or maybe you are already married and now you're like, well, these are questions that I should have asked before, but now we're here, let's try to figure this out, okay? Now, by the way, I am a Christian. And I do believe that talking about money is important, get on the same page is important, but overall, I believe God is the person that actually makes marriage work. Because if it was just about people that were responsible, come from good family, have their money together, then obviously all the good looking rich people would be the ones married forever, and the ones that were like me, well, we wouldn't be married forever. And obviously, that's not the case. I think marriage is sustained by God. Now, these questions right here are questions that I got from the Bible and not just like easy questions, but they're like biblical real questions that you should sit down and talk about. Now I do have a warning for you. It's not to say that if you're going through these questions and you're not on the same page, you should basically end it right there. That's not what it means. It does mean though, it is a conversation. You need to talk about it. You need to pray about it and basically just come together and say, Hey, here is the agreement or we can't reach an agreement and really talk about these things. Honestly, it's the best thing you could possibly do. Talk about things honestly. Okay. Now, if you guys don't know me, my name is Tommy Bryson. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. Now the very first question. Yeah, we're going to hop right into it is going to be, do you have enough money to sustain the household? Do you actually make enough? to sustain the household. If you go, for example, to the book of Genesis, um, chapter two, you're going to find a bit more detail about how God and why God actually created man and woman. And before he actually brought Eve into the picture, he made Adam, gave Adam a job, put Adam in the garden of Eden and Adam was naming animals. He did not have a helper. And then God went ahead and created Eve. Now the point is, okay, before Eve came into the picture, Adam already in a sense had a job, had a duty, had a reason to actually be there overall. My point is this, okay? If you're trying to get married and you are in love and you like this person and you're like, this is the person, but this person cannot sustain a household, there is no way for either of you to actually get married and live alone, then you really have to consider it. A lot of people actually get married and they're like, well, we're going to live with our parents because we have to, we can't actually pay for anything. We don't have the resources. That's something to consider. Consider. Now, am I saying if the person has no job, has no way to pay, has no way to actually take care of the household, you should not get married at all? The answer is no. You should probably wait a little longer until they're actually prepared or you guys are prepared to actually take care of the household. You know, the Bible says you're going to be leaving your mother and father and becoming one flesh. It's very hard to do that when you buy, but because of necessity, you have to stay there. Now it's different, right? If you get married, you had a job, things were going great. You lost your job. Now you have to go back home and figure things out. That's different, but doing things the right way is the most important thing. Okay. So making sure that person can sustain the household, either him or you guys together is super important. Now, number two, the second question here is, would you be okay if I stayed at home and took care of the household and the kids? This kind of seems like what, I mean, what type of question is this? Okay. Well, my pastor, his wife actually asked him this question before they got married. Cause it's super important. Okay. If you have this whole mindset in your head that you're basically going to be having two incomes and having kids and taking care of the household together in that way, but your wife wants to stay at home. That's the conversation to have before you actually get married. Now, if you go to the book of Titus chapter two, verse three to five is going to read like this. Okay. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husband and children to be self-control, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. My point is, okay, if you're a woman and you want to stay at home, and take care of the kids, that is beautiful. I mean, that is awesome. I like that a lot, okay? And I actually motivate that a lot. However, that's a conversation to actually have beforehand. 
And here's why. Because if beforehand you have that conversation and you guys are okay with it, the way you're actually going to build out your marriage in the beginning is going to be so it's actually sustainable based on one income and not needed to have two incomes, okay? There are a lot of people that they get married and they build a household where two incomes are mandatory. And if you don't have two incomes, everything basically falls apart. But if you go into the marriage knowing this, then in reality, you know, hey, let's build and structure all of these things, all of the expenses, all the bills based on my income, and let's make sure we have, for example, a good solid emergency fund. So if anything happens, I can find another job. So this way you can take care of the household and the kids and everything, okay? My point is you have this conversation so you know the way you're going to structure on just one income and not relying on two incomes, okay? Because if you do this correctly, if you guys get married at first, you're both working, and then you wait to have a baby to then stay at home, the answer is, well, if you only had that one income and you were worrying about that one income, then everything's fine. But if it was basically a lifestyle based on two incomes and now you're not working, then that could be a potential problem, okay? That is the idea and why you wanna ask this question beforehand. Now, do me a favor, if you got value so far within this video, um, subscribe to the channel because I have more content coming out, so I appreciate that a lot. Subscribe to the channel and let's continue. Now, the third question to ask is, do you have debt? And what is your approach when it comes to handling debt? Now, am I saying that if you're gonna marry someone with debt, you should be like, ah, I'm not gonna marry you until you're done with your debt? The answer is no. But it is basically based on approach. What do you think about debt? What is your psychology on debt? Do you wanna get into a lot of debt? Do you not wanna get into any debt? Or for example, do you think the debt you have is not your responsibility whatsoever and that someone else should pay for it? This mindset is very popular today, okay? So if you go to the Bible, um, Proverbs 22, verse seven to nine, you're going to read this, okay? The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave of the lender. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. Whoever has bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed. Um, the idea is guys, okay, the problem is not debt. The problem is the approach. If you're gonna try to marry someone who has a lot of debt and is planning to basically keep getting into more and more and more and more debt and to basically just keep having more and more problems, the answer is that could actually be a problem because for the life of your marriage, most likely he will be a slave to the lender, okay? That's not really what you want. So it's a conversation to have. It's a way to actually see the whole picture overall. If you're marrying someone that is basically saying, I know I have this debt, but I got into it, whatever, you know, the government should pay it or someone else should pay it. I mean, that's kind of injustice, you know? You're not taking responsibility. In some senses, that person could even be, for example, a robber in a way, because some people will literally, or a stealer, will literally not pay their debts, let it go into collections, and just try to forget about it altogether. That's not a right approach. Now, if you're looking at someone to marry, and let's say this person has debt, and they're saying, you know, I, I know I have this debt, I'm trying to figure it out, I'm basically trying to pay it off as fast as I possibly can. And once I'm done with it, I'm really not trying to get into debt again. That is not a bad thing. Would I marry someone that has debt and has this approach? The answer is yes, no problem. But would I marry someone who has debt and has no problem into going into even more and more debt or has no way and does not want to pay off that debt? The answer is it's a conversation to have and I would probably not marry that person right then and there. You gotta talk about those things before you actually go ahead and get married. Because you have then two people with two different approaches, one person is doing something, the other person's doing something else, and the Bible says, you know, you're supposed to be one flesh. It's not supposed to be, I do this, you do whatever you want, and that's basically it. It's very immature when you do things like that. Now, number four, guys, this question is going to sound weird and almost backwards, but it's super important, and it's basically, how much money do you want and why? You know, 
We live in a world where basically more and more and more is usually going to be better, better, better. And having this crazy ambition to have more and more wealth seems to be like a good thing in the eyes of the media. But overall, it's usually not a good sign overall. Now, the Bible says on 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many bangs, okay? The idea is, guys, is it wrong to try to be responsible when it comes to money? Is it wrong to have interest in money and to want to budget and all this stuff? The answer is no. But I know people that their entire obsession is just with wanting more and more money for the sake of wanting more money. They're willing to sacrifice time in their marriage. They're willing to sacrifice their marriage overall. They're willing to sacrifice, for example, their spiritual lives just for the sake of actually having more and more. And that's usually going to be a bad sign, something you actually want to talk about. You know, having um, an idea or a mindset to actually improve your lifestyle, to provide better for your kids. It's, it's not necessarily bad in a way, but it's something you actually want to be very careful because, you know, life is not about attaining everything because in the end, as a Christian, you're aware of this, okay? Um, how does it benefit you to gain everything in this world and then lose your soul? Or what's the benefit of accomplishing all these things and then you die and then everything is basically stays behind. It's not really a big deal. You know what I mean? So the point is, yes, you know, make enough, sustain yourself, make enough to do well, you know, that's fine. But when you have this sole ambition just for having more and more money, you want to be very careful about this. And early on, before I was a Christian, I did have this mindset, you know, and these days I care about money in the sense that I want to budget. I want to make sure things are okay. I want to think about the future long term in a way, okay? But I know I can't control anything overall. But my mindset is not, if I can make more money and just work more hours and not give time, for example, if I am married to my marriage or whatever it is, the answer is that probably is not going to be a good mindset and a good idea overall. Something to consider. So these are questions that you probably would not ask, but they're very important because their answer is, is going to give you a good sound idea of who this person's character actually is, okay? Because some people may answer by saying, I wanna have a lot, at least $10,000 a month, because I want this and I want that, you know? And it kinda sounds like the right thing, and I wouldn't tell you judge that person right then and there, because usually, it's just what we learn in the world, you know? And then if you kinda just dig a little further, you show the Bible, you explain things, you kinda just query a lot more, you kind of see like the person's like, I don't really know why I want all those things. And I don't really want to work that much to actually get it, you know? So it's a conversation. None of these questions are deal breakers. They're supposed to be questions that make you dive into more questions and a sustainable conversation to actually understand the way this person thinks. Now, here's the last question. Number five and the last one is going to be, how do you manage your money and who do you think your money actually belongs to? It sounds like a very simple question, an obvious question. Well, I budget my money like this and my money belongs to me, right? That's basically it. Um, but obviously, it's not really the full answer overall because you know the bible says in deuteronomy 10 14 it says behold to the lord your god belongs heaven and the heavens of heavens the earth with all that is in it everything belongs to the lord including your money and even when you tithe and give money you're basically just given what he already gave you you know the bible also says in second corinthians 9 7 each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I think we all know how things turn out when you try to basically give a reluctant heart and lie and things like that. We have a story in the Bible about that. But the whole concept is, you know, it's not about that you have to give everything you have. That's not what the point is here. But the mindset is, okay, when you're approaching money, how do you approach it? Where do you think it comes from? You know, overall, God has promised to sustain his creation, including us, you know, as Christians. So overall, God provides, it belongs to God, he loves a cheerful giver, you're supposed to be responsible because you have been entrusted with this, and that's the whole idea, okay? You wanna look for someone, or you wanna look for characteristics of someone who wants to be very responsible with something he's been given, 
and also wants to be generous with it, okay? Generosity does not mean ignorance. You know, I know people that they tend to look generous, but they're just really a little ignorant in the way they actually do the things they actually do. You want to look out for people that are greedy. You want to look out for people that are boastful in their giving. For example, I'm like, I, I, I'm very greedy. I don't, I don't give anything to anybody or not just, I'm not talking about just like giving money to the church, but just in the way their lifestyle is. Okay. You can tell when someone is greedy with the way they actually manage what they have. And you also want to look for people, look out for people that do things and their whole thing is, I did this, I did that. I did this for you. You need to know this. You know, you want to look out for that because you don't want to that's not really like a good sign, you know, seeing somebody that's like very boastful in what they do. Now, again, that's it, guys. These are five questions and these are biblical questions in a way. And the idea is you don't really want to use these questions to be like, well, that's it. You're done. But it's more about having a conversation, an honest one, talking these things through. And believe it or not, you know, if you're a very um, new Christian or early on in the faith, you might read some of these questions read what the Bible has to say, and you might learn something new. So it's not to say like, oh, I thought this before, but this is what it actually is, you know, and you kind of just learn. These are not deal breakers. These are more like conversations that could de that could potentially lead to deal breakers, but I'm not going to say that can't happen. They could lead to that, but that's not the intention. The intention is more like, let's see what you think about these things. What's your approach on this? And then you talk about it and consider it. And if someone that you talk to, you know, is actually willing to actually say, you know, I think this approach is actually best. It's a biblical approach. And they're actually saying, well, you know, I, I, I renounce what I used to do. The answer is give some time, an appropriate amount of time to actually see that this person has given fruit and is actually doing with his life what he has said and confessed with his mouth. That is the idea, guys, okay? But yeah, thanks for watching this video. Like, subscribe. I hope these questions help. And let me know if you like this type of video so I can actually make more of them. If you don't, let me know in the comments down below. And as always, like, subscribe. Another video here. Peace.